Hello, and welcome to Business 101. I'm your professor, John Harvey. Today we're going to discuss Chapter 5, which is covering the business uh, types of business. So the basic business uh, forms are a sole proprietor, a partnership, and a corporation. What's interesting to note is the large majority of businesses are sole proprietor. You can see the numbers um, is roughly around 70% of most businesses are actually sole proprietors. However, when you start counting in sales, you will see that the large majority of the sales are actually coming from corporations. There's this huge disconnect. And part of that disconnect is the fact that when you start a business, you will start in one form of that business, and then you will transition from that into one of these other businesses. So this is a evolution, if you will, in your business. You may start in one form and then modify or change over time depending on your size or needs. So let's start discussing each one of these in detail, and that will give you an overview as to what business form you would want to start in and what business form uh, you may consider in the future. On the next slide, we can see sole proprietorships. Now this is the most common form of business, and some of the advantages of it are that it's easy to get started. It's uh, you're your own boss, and you have the ownership of it. When we're talking a sole proprietor, this is literally when somebody just says, I'm going to start a business, and they rent a storefront, they buy product, and they open it up for sale. The disadvantages of being a sole proprietorship is one, the liability. You yourself are liable for everything. So if somebody trips and hurts themselves, someone chokes on your product or anything like that, you and your personal assets are responsible. They are liable, meaning that you are the one that will have to pay if you lose a lawsuit. So because of this, uh, because of that risk, you'll probably steer away from starting a sole proprietorship. However, it is very easy and very cheap to start. You don't have to pay any forms. You don't, you don't have to pay any dollars. You don't have to file any forms with the state. You don't have any of that activity. You're just starting off right from the beginning and saying, I'm gonna start this business, so here I go. The other disadvantage of that is um, it's your own investment. You know, you as a person are putting in all of the money, all of the time, all of the effort. So those are some of the pros and cons to a sole proprietorship. Bear in mind that um, this is where the large majority of businesses start. And then as they move or become more successful, they change from one to the other. But it's very risky from a legal standpoint. On the next slide, we'll see partnerships. Now there's two general types of partnerships, and we'll go over um, other pieces of this in more detail, but there's a general partnership. This is where all of the profits and losses are shared equally among all those involved. So if I'm a general partner uh, with somebody else and we make $100, it's probably split 50-50. If we lose $100 and we have to go out of business, we're going to split that loss 50-50. I'm going to have to come up with 50 bucks and my partner is going to have to come up with 50 bucks. Because of that, your general partnership is very straightforward in terms of how to set it up and in terms of how to um, disassemble or, or when, you, when you leave. Um, one of the other partnerships that we have is a limited partnership. Now in a limited partnership, this is where you may have somebody that wants to be a passive investor. So they may have some money that they're willing to fund your activities, but they don't want to actually work in the business. They're not going to be the ones that show up day to day, make the decisions on you know, what inventory to buy or what services to provide or any of those details. They're just kind of being the money person. You know, They provide some funds for you. They may check in occasionally and see how, how things are going. That's what you have as a passive investor, right? You still are a general partner if you're the one running the business, but the passive investor is uh, what changes the dynamic from a general partnership to a limited partnership. Now, let's talk in detail on those partnerships. Um, there are a couple new forms of partnerships. 
So let's look at this slide. We have uh, master limited partnerships. Now these are very interesting because they're publicly traded, which we haven't talked about yet, but it's a way in which um, they can get funding, um, which is very much like a, a regular corporation. But they're also taxed as a partnership. So this is very unique in that um, the way that you're taxing uh, is very much like a small business. Very, very simple, you know, as a partnership, you're splitting that, that money. But if you need to raise funds, you can actually get shares and try and get investors and get those dollars um, to help you start that business. So that's a master limited partnership. I would like to uh, put in the disclaimer here that if you have more questions on this, I can provide some information, but clearly a tax lawyer would be one that would provide you with more details um, and help you set up which business would be right for you. Now, in a limited liability partnership, this is similar to a regular partnership, but what you've done is actually created a liability um, <clears throat> um, safety net, if you will. So what happens is you as a partnership, you're splitting the profits and losses in whatever form, you know, maybe 80-20 or 50-50 or however that works. So that part's the same, but what changes is the liability. So in the general partnership and in the sole proprietorship, that liability is straight out. In a, in a sole proprietorship, you're the one with all the liability. In a general partnership, that liability is split between those partners and whatever distribution you're splitting those profits and losses. But now in a limited liability partnership, you have the ability to separate out that liability into just the business. So whatever funds you put into the business, um, whatever efforts or equity is in that business, um, if there's some sort of legal situation or you know, liability lawsuit or something like that, the funds that are in the business are what's at stake, but not your individual personal assets. So this is a very uh, useful form of business. You have that gain and loss and you split it up, but when it comes to liability, you don't need to worry about your own personal car, your own personal house, and all of those things um, being uh, potentially taken from you um, in a lawsuit. On the next slide, you can see partnerships. Now, I gave you some of this already. So, uh, first of all, the advantage is you have more financial resources. The reason why is because you have a partner. So, hopefully, you're finding people that can help fund the business if you don't have the money yourself. There's shared management. You have more people involved. Um, it's a longer survival. You may have three or four people in the business. If one of them leaves, the business continues. In a sole proprietorship, you don't see that, right? When the manager leaves, that's the end of the business. Some of the disadvantages, though, is that um, <clears throat> you're still dividing the profits. So, you may be the one working very hard in the business and those profits may be split in one percentage or another. Um, and so these are where the terms of the partnership need to be drafted up and agreed upon before you start the business. You don't want to get in the middle of this thing um, and then have to deal with all this. How much is your ownership? How much is my ownership? And let's figure this thing out. Um, the disagreement among partners can be a huge problem because if you have two of them and one of them want, and one of you guys wants to quit, now you have to value the business. How much is it worth? How much do you need to buy to get the other person out? That kind of stuff. So it can be difficult to terminate um, for those reasons. So on the next slide, let's talk about corporations. So. In corporations, we have the conventional corporation, or what we would call the C-Corp. We also have the S-Corporation, and then we also have a limited liability company. Let's go over those in more detail. So on the next slide, we're going to talk about what a corporation is. So corporations allow you to, um, if it's a private corporation, the, the stock or the equity in the business is not traded on any sort of public stock exchange. So when you think about Google or Microsoft, you can go and buy shares of that company. Um, 
on an exchange. So you can go and find out what the price is of a share of Microsoft and buy that. When it's a private company, you don't see those shares. They're not available to the public. They're not traded on any sort of exchange. That's the difference between a private and a public corporation. So public shares are traded on an exchange. Next, you have a nonprofit corporation. Nonprofits um, have a unique uh, advantage in that they're, they have a special tax consideration. Um, depending on how they're set up, sometimes these corporations may have no taxes. This can be very advantageous, as well as um, a nonprofit isn't really focused on trying to um, make a profit. Because it's a nonprofit, the focus is actually on other uh, performance measurements. So, easiest example of a nonprofit that you'd probably be most familiar with is some sort of religious organization. If you attend a uh, um, an organization on a, on a Sunday or something like that, that organization is what we'd call a nonprofit corporation most of the time. So, um, that's one example that you can think of when you're talking about a nonprofit organization. Other ones would be um, where they're focusing on some sort of humanitarian or outreach kind of purpose. And we'll cover more of that in some of our later chapters. Now, let's turn our attention towards the next slide, which is talking about the corporate structure. In a corporation, you have um, at, the, at the base, you have employees. These are the people that are working the business. Now, those employees will, you know, take orders, um, move inventory, ship product, that kind of stuff. Then up above that, you have managers or supervisors. Now, these are the ones that are um, supervising or, or watching over the employees, making sure they're focused on the right tasks and meeting uh, what the corporation or the business is trying to do. Those managers will report to officers. Now the officers, those are the ones that are in charge of the direction of the company. They're the ones that are ultimately responsible for um, several of the um, critical pieces of the business. And they also report directly to the board of directors. So when you, when you have officers, you would think of um, chief executive officer or CEO. You might think of a CFO, which is a chief financial officer. Those are all officers in the business. Okay? They res report directly to the board of directors. Now the board of directors sits and provides um, oversight into the business. This is generally where you have outside input on the business. So usually the CEO will, will meet with the board of directors and provide some sort of input to them. And say, here's where we're going this year, here's how we did this year, um, here's my opinions on our strategy and direction. And that board of uh, directors will provide input into that and say, you know, Mike, consider this, or we're seeing some of this other stuff. And they help provide some, some kind of balance and direction or vision for the company. It's important to know that you can have officers and board of directors, and those don't necessarily have to be the owners. So you may own the business and have this whole structure set up where you have a board of directors that's working with the officers, you may be the owner that's outside of that. The other way to look at it is shareholders. These are the people that have bought shares in the company. They ultimately vote to uh, allow or, or not allow somebody into the board of directors. So they have direct input um, as to who that board of directors is. That board of directors is the group that will actually hire the officers. Um, the CEO primarily, and then the CEO will probably um, put in his recommendations for the other officers. So this is a quick overview on the corporate structure. In one of the later chapters, we're going to talk about organizational structure, and we'll go into more detail. But understand that as a corporation, you will have these, um, these structures and these groupings. So let's look at the next slide. Now let's talk about the C corporation in a little more detail. What's important to note about a C corporation, one is it's the classic corporation that you're thinking of. When you think of IBM, you think of HP, you think of Microsoft, you think of um, 
any large Walmart, any of these large corporations, that's your classic C corporation. Okay. What's, uh, what's important or one of the things that I highlight here is that in the C corporation, you can have this conflict between the stockholders and the board of directors. So um, a corporation may be uh, performing it in a certain way, maybe taking on certain activities. How, that's, how they accomplish that stuff may be um, against what the shareholders are wanting. So that is a disadvantage. So now let's talk about S corporations. S corporations are unique because they are taxed um, as an individual. When you have an S corporation, you are able to raise funds by having shareholders, but you can only have up to 100 shareholders. So this, this limits you. you. You're really looking at some large uh, amounts of money that are provided by certain individuals for an ownership in the business. So you're expecting that as an S corporation, you're not gonna have a whole lot of shareholders. You're just getting a, a couple of them at, that are providing the funds so they want the ownership in the business. So that's kind of how the, the S corp works. But the taxation is what's interesting because as an S corp, it's taxed as personal income. So when the company makes money and has revenue, that's what goes on the individual's uh, tax forms based on however that, that uh, split out is. So it's unique that you can raise funds by having shareholders, but you can also um, have your tax as just regular personal uh, income tax. Let's look at the next slide, which covers the limited liability company. A limited liability company actually has no stock, so you're not able to raise funds in this way. You raise funds by having partners in the business, whether they're uh, uh, joint partnerships or a general partnership or a, a limited um, one. So in the limited liability company, you have a whole bunch of tax choices. You have the limited liability, which is the key factor for a business. Um, and it provides you a lot of flexibility in how you set up the, the, the structure of the business. Um, but it is a limited lifespan. It only has a certain amount of time. Um, and the big thing is, if you need to raise funds, you're looking at either getting a, another partner in the business or changing the structure of the company. So the no stock is a big factor there. So that's an overview of the types of corporations that you as a, a, a business can choose. You can start in one of those and move um, or select another one as you need to. So you may start in a sole proprietorship, eventually realize you wanna have some liability uh, coverage. So you'll start an LLC, a limited liability company. Then you realize you need to raise funds, so now you're talking about an S Corp or a C Corp. Um, and eventually you end up in a situation where you will find the right type of corporation that you have um, for your needs and you pretty much stay there. So that completes the different types of corporations and businesses. Now let's talk about businesses and mergers and, and um, the types of mergers that you have. So on this slide, let's look at the types of mergers. We have horizontal, uh, vertical, and a conglomerate. Now in a horizontal merger, this is where you have two companies that are in the same industry that join. So if I'm in, um, this would be like a crazy example, but this would be like Coca-Cola and Pepsi joining together, okay? So they're in the same industry, they're both doing soft drinks, they're providing beverages, they have a distribution network. They join together and that's what we would call a horizontal merger. Next you have a vertical merger. Now this is where you have companies that are in different stages of a related business. So if I'm, let's use the Coca-Cola example. If I'm Coca-Cola and I wanted to have a vertical merger I will then look at who is distributing my product. So I may say I'm the one bottling Coca-Cola, I'm the one you know, putting it in these packages and then I'm giving it to a, a trucking company to move it from 
my plant into you know my customers stores I may want to buy that company I may not want to pay this trucker um, or this trucking company to move my product maybe I just want to start buying that business and then take over all of the distribution part of this um, I may look at it and say we buy a lot of sugar or uh, high fructose corn syrup to put in our, our beverages so maybe I want to actually buy the producer of high fructose corn syrup so there I'm buying one of my suppliers or maybe I'm buying one of my customers you know one of my uh, parts of this so there these other businesses are at different stages in the business okay so a vertical integration is where you're buying up and down that supply chain those that are supplying to you or those that you're buying from those kind of things next we have a conglomerate now in a conglomerate is very interesting because there's no relation this is where you have a company that is in everything uh, <clears throat> One of those examples, and let's talk about this on the next slide. So on a conglomerate, some examples of this would be Philip Morris. Did you know that Philip Morris owns Kraft, as well as Marlboro, um, and it also provides other things. So Siemens, this is a great example. I actually have a Siemens dishwasher, okay? But Siemens also does large scale um, infrastructure building. They like build bridges in other countries, okay? General Electric, they provide power infrastructure, right? So they're electricity, and they also own NBC, which is a broadcasting network. So you can see that in a conglomerate, there's no relation with these businesses. They're just completely just buying up all of these different uh, parts or different companies, and then conglomerating or combining them all into one large company. The reason why conglomerates happen is businesses may find that their their core focus is um, cyclical it might be seasonal so they may find that as a bottling or as a coca-cola I have a large amount of sales in the summertime for example this may or may not be the case but you may have a large amount of sales in the summertime but your wintertime sales are low so you may look for another business to run that has a large amount of sales in the winter time so that you can kind of focus in the summertime you'll focus on you know bottling and distributing soft drinks in the winter time you're uh, focused on making ski apparel or something like that so a conglomerate just takes a whole bunch of these things and overall will provide a balanced um, amount of revenue and income and, and margin overall so on the next slide we'll talk about what a leveraged buyout is this is an important concept because um, this is where a, a business is running uh, in probably one of those C corporations like we're talking about so there's stock that's out there what will happen is in a leveraged buyout employees will actually try and buy up as much stock as they can and take over the business the reason why it's called a leveraged buyout is because they'll take out a loan in order to buy all of that stock so it's not that uh, you gather 50 employees together and they all chip in their money and and then say let's take over uh, Winco or something like that what happens is <clears throat> they collect and then they contact a bank or someone and say we as a, the collective employees want to buy this business and we'll take out a loan in order to do it so you have a group you take a loan and then they purchase the company so they purchase the majority of the shares, become the majority owner of the business, and that's what a leveraged buyout is. Now on the next slide, um, it's important to talk about why mergers don't work sometimes. So we've talked about vertical mergers, horizontal mergers, and conglomerates. So mergers don't work a lot of times because, um, or not a lot of times, but several times when a business doesn't work you can point to these as reasons one is that a firm may just flat out overpay for business um, it's kind of like buyers beware you go in and you think that this company has a huge amount of sales great infrastructure wonderful people and then all of a sudden you're looking at it and you go I paid way too much for this business they have no assets they have no intellectual property and oh my gosh what do I do right 
So then you're looking at this merger and you say, well, we merged, but really I don't want this merger. So um, <clears throat> when you overpay for a company, this can be a big problem. Um, there's generally some management disagreements. When you have two companies that are operating in the same industry, they generally have some sort of difference, right? They have a different philosophy on how they're gonna approach customers and markets and what they're gonna do. So when you merge a company, who's gonna be in charge? Well, one or the other. So right away, you have to start picking your management and are you gonna pick it from one company or from the other company? Who's buying who? These are all um, kind of speak to this cultural issue. And that is, if you don't combine and create a unified culture as a business, these mergers become two separate businesses running under the same uh, environment, under the same uh, corporation. So if you don't completely merge, you miss the, the synergy or the opportunities to um, really take advantage of why you wanted to merge in the first place. So let's look at the next slide, which we're covering uh, cooperatives. So cooperatives um, are kind of a, a strange breed, if you will, of business. This is where um, it's owned and controlled by the people that use it. So we see this in uh, examples like in farms, you know, where people will, um, farmers will combine or collect all of their produce together and then sell it collectively and then split those profits. Um, in Boise, we have what's called the Boise Co-op. And this is an example of that where um, people will actually go in and at one point they would help stock the shelves because you as a help co-owner in this co-op um, are participating in that. So um, you pool your resources together and collectively you're hoping that you have enough economic power to you know, make this business run. So um, farms are good examples of this. Vineyards might be another one. Um, and you have some kind of retail outlets that do this on occasion. So let's turn our attention from co-ops and corporations and focus in on franchising. This is an interesting part of the book and I think we cover this in, in another chapter in more detail. But here, when you're looking at franchises, um, you have a franchise agreement and you have a franchisor and a franchisee. So let's talk about what each one of those are and, and how they work together in a franchise. So on the next slide, we're looking at the franchise contract. Okay? This is where we're going to get into it. So as a franchise, you may, uh, let's back up. Why would you want to pick a franchise? You would pick a franchise because you as an individual want to start a business. Say you want to start a fast food business. You look into your community and you say, there's not a lot going on. Um, there's not a whole lot of opportunities for people to go out and eat, so I want to do this. Now, do I want to go and buy a, a facility and then figure out what kind of stoves to buy and what kind of cash registers to buy and what to you know, paint the the building and what kind of design and logo I want to have in there and um, you know you're starting a business from scratch there's so much involved um, there's so many decisions to be made and frankly you as an individual may not know what works and what doesn't work you know you have an idea but are you gonna research every piece of this okay this is where a franchise comes into play a franchise is where somebody has already started a business figured out how it works, and then documented all of the pieces of the business. So they cover how you make the product, how you sell the product, where you get the product from, all, the, all those pieces. And so you as an individual will um, buy into this franchise. Okay? We'll talk a little bit more, uh, but the franchise contract is where you, as a franchisee, are giving the franchisor money. So you say, I, as a franchisee, am going to give you $50,000 or something to start, a corp, to start a franchise. You, as a franchise, or you're going to give me um, all the documentation. You're going to help me provide uh, the, the monitoring and the performance. Um, you're going to help me get the product together and help me set up this business. And because you've done it and you've done it multiple times, you can tell me 
uh, what's going to work and what's not going to work. So the chances of my success at owning this business and running this franchise, much better than if I started as a sole proprietor, come up with my own business and just try to wing it, right? Franchises are built off of experience. So on the next slide, we look at a franchisor, okay? Now a franchisor is the one that assigns the territory and says that you own, you, you own the business in this area. Uh, the franchisor will provide some sort of financial advice. Generally, they say you should have this much cash on hand, you should have this much equity and all these kind of things. They help supply the merchandise, they connect you with the suppliers, um, and they most importantly provide training and support for your business. You can call your franchisor and say, I need help or I want to expand or I want to do something. They generally have a good idea as to how to do that. Okay? So that's what a franchisor provides. The franchisee will pay an upfront cost. So there's usually a, a good chunk of money right up front. Then they will make a monthly payment into the franchisor. Um, and a lot of times there's also a percentage of the revenue. So you're paying for that knowledge, you're paying for that experience, and you're paying for that um, statistical advantage of using and leveraging that previous knowledge for your own benefit. So as a franchisee, um, you're still running the business, um, you're actually buying the materials, you're doing these things, but um, there's the upfront cost, there's usually a monthly fee, and you're usually looking at some sort of revenue uh, percentage there. So that's what a franchisee provides. So on the next slide, I list out the advantages and disadvantages. We've pretty much covered this. The advantages are that a franchise uh, covers the management and the marketing assistance. Um, you do have that personal ownership still, uh, but you get this financial advice. You have a much lower failure rate. Um, so those are the advantages. The disadvantages, you know, there's a lot of costs. You have this upstart cost, you have uh, shared profits, um, and so you have all of these kind of things that you'll have to factor into your business. On the next slide, I actually show you the cost of some franchises. Now this was taken um, back in 2006, I believe, so you probably want to check out the, uh, the companies themselves for more up-to-date um, prices. But to give you an idea, to start a Burger King, Burger King franchise, you have to have $50,000 up front. And then they're going to get a royalty or that monthly fee of 8.75%. Okay? So you can look through the rest of these, but this gives you an idea as to what kind of prices, what kind of costs you would have if you started a franchise. So uh, the next slide says how to avoid a franchise, uh, a franchise lemon. So one of the things is you want to get all the costs up front. You don't want to buy into this idea that it's just $100 a month or something like that. You need to know all of the costs. So you also want to know um, how they're going to handle certain things. So you're going to research the officers. You're going to get a summary of um, has there been any sort of litigation or bankruptcy or any of those kind of issues dealing with this franchisor, okay? dealing with that company. because you're buying into that and remember what happens in a franchise um, affects all of the different franchises. If the corporate McDonald's does something, all of the retail, all the uh, franchisees that have McDonald's, they're affected by that. So um, you want to be aware of those bankruptcies or any sort of litigation as soon as possible. Okay? And then you're going to review that contract and look at the recent financial statements. You want to know how much money you think this franchise is going to make and based on what. And so um, really all of this points to you doing a lot of research before you buy into a franchise. It has its advantages and this is one of the ways, probably the best way, that you can avoid um, buying into a franchise lemon. So on the next slide, I want to talk about home-based businesses. Now the advantage of a home-based business is that you as an individual are working out of your home, so you have flexible work hours, you have that quality lifestyle, you're doing work out of, you know, that you choose. Um, you have that opportunity to um, 
expand however you, you decide. And frankly, you're self-motivated, so your rewards are tied to your, uh, your, your efforts. So those are the advantages. What you have to look at is um, what kind of business you want to get into. What kind of market is that in and how much um, is available to grow in that. So be aware that uh, a home-based business can be very challenging as well, but um, it definitely has some benefits. So we've covered the types of companies, we've talked about merging companies, and then we've talked about the franchises and how those are kind of a, a hybrid of some of those things. So this completes chapter five, where we've talked about the forms of business. Thank you.